Welcome to this edition of Naples Daily Newsmakers. Coming up later in the program, we meet Rick Barber, chair of the Big Cypress Basin, and Pete Antonacci, executive director of the South Florida Water Management District. And they'll discuss water issues here in Southwest Florida. But first, we go to health reporter Liz Freeman and her interview of the founder of the Blue Zones program and the local program coordinator for the Blue Zones initiative right here in Southwest Florida. We have Dan Butner here, founder of the Blue Zones Project, and Debbie Millsap, executive director of the Blue Zones Project in Southwest Florida. And we'd like to talk to you a little bit about how did Naples get selected for a Blue Zones Project, and how did you connect with the NCH healthcare system? We, they didn't really get selected. Um, Alan Weiss, the CEO of NCH, actually did a search, and they're one of the few healthcare systems in America, I think, that are really sort of taking this accountability idea to heart and uh, trying to generate health rather than just making sick people less sick. So he was out looking for projects that have been uh, successful at the population level at making people healthier, and he found us, and he actually came to see us in Iowa, and then we came here to make sure people really want us to be here, the schools, the grocery stores, the city government, and uh, we kind of chose each other, actually. Okay. And do you have any other healthcare systems that are sponsoring Blue Zones initiatives elsewhere in the United States? Yes, uh, in the Los Angeles is a healthcare system sponsoring it. Uh, it's mostly the Blue Cross Blue Shield plans, uh, insurance companies that want to see insurance costs or healthcare costs go down over time. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say NCH is way ahead of the pack when it comes to really thinking about uh, avoiding disease rather than treating disease. Okay. And Florida is the first, uh, Naples is the first location here in Florida that is pursuing it, is that correct? Yes. Do you find that unusual? Uh, this is a new idea, actually. Uh, I would have expected to see it really embraced in places like San Francisco and New York where there are big populations. So um, there is, a, I, I think, I think, um, they're batting beyond their league when it comes to uh, innovation. I know Florida hospital systems had looked at doing something with Blue Zones a few years back. So I think with the uh, aging population and so many people coming here uh, later in life, I think there's a natural appetite for this sort of thing. And does that pose an issue that we are a seasonal population with winter residents who are older, and then we have tourists who don't live here and are part-time residents. Does that pose challenges that are going to be difficult for us to address? No, it doesn't matter. The uh, Blue Zones, unlike other sort of preventative health programs, instead of trying to change individual behaviors, we try to change the environment, mm -hmm. the places we live in, our homes, uh, policy at the, at the governmental level, schools and restaurants and so forth. So it doesn't matter when people come uh, or who it is. It doesn't matter their ethnicity or their demographic breakdown. This is one of those things that's going to lift the tide that rises all boats. Okay. Deb, what do you have to say about it? I mean, how, how is our local project addressing the, you know, the retiree population and the part-time residents in our, in our plan? Yeah, it, it's, it's really a we project. So everyone, we want everyone to embrace it and give everyone the opportunity to embrace it. Some of our events have actually been uh, scheduled for when our seasonal population is back. And uh, so we've been working hard on it. We're now launching it. And so we're looking forward to our seasonal res residents being involved. We really look at that as an enhancement too because as they go up north or out west, wherever they come from in the summer months, they'll share it with other people. So it expands beyond. We've had a little bit of a pushback locally from the school district. We have some parents and some school board members who say we don't want this. Has that happened in other locations or with other government entities? And, and how do you address that? It's never happened this first time because we, we spent time to, uh, to uh, get to know this community and make sure we were wanted. And the superintendent uh, indicated that uh, this is something that uh, Naples was interested in. And um, then we came down and there, some board members had, had a problem with it. But they had a problem because I think they failed to understand what the program is. All we do is come with a menu of evidence-based ways to make a community healthier. And the schools get to choose which ones they want to implement. They don't have to implement any one of them. Mm -hmm. But um, if, 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 if uh, schools want to have 
soda machines and they think that's the best thing for their kids, they can have them, but then we'll have three or four other things we want them to do to make fruits and vegetables more accessible and, sweet, and sweets a little bit less accessible. Okay. Are there any other communities in Florida that are kind of watching what's happening here in Southwest Florida to model after us or to make a decision about going forward? You know, as Dr. Weiss talks throughout uh, Florida, and he's with the Florida Hospital Association. He also talks nationally, mm -hmm. and a lot of he gets a lot of interest um, because of what he's doing with the Blue Zones Project. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's some additional communities that. So we're in 26 cities throughout the country, and we find what happens is you start with one city because mm -hmm. every state is a little bit different, and the project shows up slightly different depending on where we are. And we're very rigorous about measuring. Uh, uh, Healthways Gallup Wellbeing Index will measure 90 different facets of health, well-being of the population here. And I think we have to earn our way into a state. We have to show that we can make a population healthier, and then it's a lot easier to spread the statewide. We started with three cities in Iowa four years ago, and, and now there are 15 cities in Iowa. So it's the demonstration site model. Absolutely interesting. And so economically, what will the impact be for us locally? Will it be an economic boost for us ultimately in some way? I can give you some examples of other places. So in the beach cities, uh, 150,000 people or so, um, we managed to lower the average BMI by 14% and cut childhood obesity in half from nine, 18 to 9% in four years. And that was four years? Okay. Four years. It takes a while. Yeah. You don't see it overnight. Sure. But that will occasion literally tens of millions of projected health care savings. We also lowered the smoking rate by 29%. So that means in 10 years there won't be a percentage of lung cancer. There are 1,900 fewer obese people, so they're like, less likely to suffer type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. So the actuaries have modeled out what that will save them, and it's in the tens of millions of dollars. And we expect to have an even bigger impact here. And so funding-wise, we know that NCH is, is funding the program, at least initially. How will this program sustain itself through the years to come, for eight to ten years out? I actually don't know the, the specifics of Well, one of the things um, from the get-go, with it being this WE project, and primarily the volunteers are the ones who come in and make it happen, uh, NCH invested for eight years okay. so that we could really, we could really lay the th groundwork and get as many people on board, have that kind of tipping point where people are sharing with each other to keep it going. Um, so that's part of the plan. It's just this long commitment to the project. And then there's, through the Blue Zones project, there is um, what, uh, monitoring to keep you certified after you uh, become a Blue Zone certified uh, area, so community, so. I can tell you economically, uh, nationwide in our 26 cities, uh, our 26 cities have found about $150 million of grants based on Blue Zones work, uh, optimizing the built environment, optimizing the food environment for schools. Blue Zones becomes a platform then to attract uh, uh, economic support for doing the work of health. Uh, and I think the big advantage is we actually measure. It's not one of these things that it's a feel good, veggie, eat your veggies or fun run. Uh, we actually are measured at the beginning, and every year we're expected to return uh, uh, lower BMI, lower weight, uh, lower smoking rates, uh, increase in healthy behavior, and then uh, a rise in overall well-being. And that occasions more productivity system-wide, lower absenteeism, and all of these have a connection to overall economic well-being. So at some point you'll do a measurement, a benchmark measurement? for this region? It's already been done. So that's been done, mm -hmm. okay. Yes. So when was that done? That was done in the spring, this past okay. spring. Okay. And then as we work in the community, we'll remeasure uh, with the Gallup Healthways polling. Okay. And remeasure and uh, see how we're doing, tweak if we need to. Uh -huh. um, but it's definitely based on measure. Okay. measurement you know we can't manage it if we don't measure it and there's lots of other measures too you know a grocery store is going to have different measures and a school is going to have different measures so there's I remember reading and I can't remember which communities it was about parks along a riverfront or greenways along a riverfront how much has blue zones fostered projects that may not have happened in some communities so the first step 
is to realize that part of the obesity problem in America is because we're sitting in our cars and not on our feet. Mm -hmm. So, and that part of the reason is, is because it's so much easier to drive than it is to walk. Uh, we have a, uh, um, an expert on our team named Dan Burden who f begins by taking uh, city leaders on a walk through their neighborhood to see why it's hard or dangerous to walk. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he creates a vision for a more walkable community, like a river, a Riverside or a Main Street. Mm -hmm. um, and once they can see a vision of it, and once they can understand how that will impact obesity numbers, then it's a lot easier to change plans so that streets are built not just for cars, but also for humans. But that takes that takes money to do that. So you, do you have to get the government's buy-in usually? Or? It, it actually doesn't, it's, it, could, it can take money, but there's money allocated. So every three or four years, roads are redone. So the next time roads can be redone, you can add a lane for traffic, or you can add a lane for bicyclists and widened sidewalks. And it's really up, for the, up to the community to decide. Uh, we're very good at working within existing transportation budgets and not trying to go out and spend new money. So looking forward, eight years from now, 10 years from now, how can you see Naples being influenced, changed by the Blue Zones project? Well, I think there'll be, just guessing, I, I would say 50% of the schools will be Blue Zone certified, so it's a healthier environment for kids, and you're gonna see BMI drop in kids. Um, I think you'll, we'll see 100 or so Blue Zones approved restaurants where the healthy choice is a little bit easier and um, people are eating healthy every time they go out to eat in those restaurants. I think we'll have the big employers here making their workplaces a little bit healthier. I think there'll be a half a dozen policies passed that are gonna favor fruits and vegetables over junk food. Um, it's not gonna be a single silver bullet, but what we're good at is unleashing silver buckshot. Uh, each of those little peb uh, BBs move a population to half a percent and we'll unleash 40 or 50 of them. And measuring it every year, we see every single time there's an improvement. So just guessing, there'll be a 10% improvement in this community. Lower BMI, lower smoking, more physical activity. Sounds great, thank you, appreciate it. It's great being here, thank you. Thank you. Joining us now on the set of Naples Daily Newsmakers is Pete Antonacci, the new director of the South Florida Water Management District, and Rick Barber, who's well known here as an engineer in the community, but also as the chairman of the Big Cypress Basin Board here in Collier County. Gentlemen, thank you for taking time out of your day here to join us on the set of Newsmaker. So, thank you for inviting us. Uh, Pete, you want to talk about some of the challenges that you found that you've walked into here with uh, your position with the Water District? Well, it's my second month on the job, and uh, there, are, uh, there are many challenges, uh, as with any uh, organization that includes about 1,400 people uh, and uh, billions of dollars worth of infrastructure and an important public responsibility. For my part, um, there, there are two primary objectives. Number one, to make sure that the flood control obligations that the district has uh, to the people that live here uh, are maintained. Um, and the good men and women of the district are out there every day making sure that the pumps work, the weirs work, the gates work, uh, and the canals are maintained. The second issue is to uh, try to keep our projects that we have that are uh, ongoing, that are part of the Everglades restoration undertaking, uh, are going forward and going forward with dispatch. Uh, we've had a lot of um, um, distractions over the past few years, and those distractions have oftentimes put us behind schedule. And um, I know the board is committed to uh, keeping us on schedule, and I'm committed to working with them to achieve that. Uh, Rick, I wanna turn to you. You know, this is the time of season where people are getting their final tax bills and so forth, and one of the questions that's come up in past years is when somebody opens their tax bill, what am I getting for my uh, tax dollars here to the uh, Basin Board and the Water District? Do you wanna tackle uh, what that? Sure, the, the um, I think the total budget for Big Cypress Basin this year is about 12 
twelve million eight hundred thousand. Um, there's about nine point six million in ad valorem taxes that make up that budget. And the rest is from reserves. Um, Thirty-nine percent of the of the uh, budget this in in sixteen is dedicated to operations and maintenance of our flood, flood control system that, that serves Collier County. And there's about 2.4 million in, in four local projects that we've funded with uh, other governmental entities. Uh, City of Naples, um, 680,000 for a reclaimed water project. Uh, Conservation of aquifer storage and recovery well number four in the city of Naples to offset the burden of traditional water sources of about a million gallons a day for 400,000. Uh, Layla Area Stormwater Improvement Program, or known as LASIP in the, in the county, which is, is nearing completion, was a $937,000 uh, grant this year. And drainage improvements in Marco Island made up about $63,000. Uh, then there's lots of capital projects to maintain our system. We're up constantly upgrading structures so they, they uh, are able to convey floodwaters more efficiently, but hold back the water in the, in the dry season so that we're recharging the aquifer. Uh, in the minute uh, we've got left here before we go to break, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but can you generalize for us, Pete? Uh, is Everglades restoration an ongoing process? Some people may think there's not much going on with it, but there's a lot going on. There's a huge amount going on. Uh, the people of Florida and the people of the United States have put billions of dollars into the restoration project. It, it begins with storing more water in the upper chain of lakes in, in the Kissimmee River Valley. Uh, it also includes building two enormous reservoirs, one on the west and one on the east side uh, of Lake Okeechobee. Um, and then primarily, there are lots of smaller pro uh, projects as well, but a very large project in Dade County that is helping the water, uh, good water, good clean water, uh, get uh, to, uh, through Dade County uh, to the park, to the Everglades National Park, to agriculture, and then ultimately to outfall. Um, those are the kinds of projects that we're working on every day to make sure that the contractors are doing their job and that, and that the uh, projects are being worked on and completed. We'll have more with uh, Pete Antonacci and also Rick Barber after the break, and we'll also talk about the U.S. Sugar Land deal. Stay with us. We're back now on Newsmakers with Pete Antonacci, the director of the South Florida Water Management District, and Rick Barber, who chairs the Big Cypress Basin Board here in Collier County. Uh, gentlemen, um, and I'll turn to you with this, Rick. We heard a lot of conversation here about the, the, the purchase that was suggested of the option on the sugar land south of the lake. From the uh, district's perspective, why was that not a good deal to go through with? Well, it <sighs> There were several reasons, but the the purchase price was from five hundred to seven hundred million dollars alone. The land could was subject to a leaseback provision that lasted for twenty years. So in the first ten years, we could only acquire or use eleven 1 hundred acres, which wouldn't make much of a reservoir. Um, the land that that was being considered was has fairly deep muck strata on it, so any construction of uh, dikes, that sort of thing would have to be hauled in material. Uh, the, the infrastructure alone to build the reservoir was about a, a billion dollars. We felt at the time that just the purchase price itself would divert money that was needed to, to build structures that were already approved and uh, the, the system that would serve the Everglades. So we're finally building projects. I think there's 98 of them all told in the, what they call the yellow book, which was the, 
the map, if you will, for the construction of the, of the system, the restoration of the system. So uh, we didn't want to get off track on building those projects and, and, and getting them done. One of the those projects, as I understand it, is referred to as C43. Pete, can you uh, situate where that is for us here and, and what that project will enable the district to do? It's located in Henry County, uh, several miles south of the Caloosahatchee River. Um, it's it's going to be the biggest uh, man-made reservoir in Florida when it is constructed. Uh, finally, after talking about C43 for over mm -hmm. 15 years, we've the board authorized a contract um, two months ago uh, to begin scraping the land. So we have contractors out there today um, starting on the first phase, um, preparing the land, um, removing farm structures, uh, roads and canals and that sort of thing, preparing the land uh, to be turned into a reservoir. Uh, it's essential uh, to, uh, to have a, a reservoir that large to store water um, so that the Caloosahatchee River can be hydrated uh, at the times of the year that the Caloosahatchee needs water um, and not completely reliant on Lake Okeechobee water. And it's also going to be a, a good place to store water generally uh, as, um, as water flows from uh, the western side of the lake uh, towards, uh, towards that structure. Um, we're very excited about it. It's a, there's a companion reservoir on the east side uh, of the lake, uh, coincidentally called C44, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a project not as large uh, as the one on the west side of the lake, uh, but it serves the same purpose, um, uh, storage, uh, to put the water where we need it, uh, when we need it. Last minute or so we've got here, Rick, can you kind of describe how that will function uh, from a water storage capacity, whether it's going to be underground storage or above ground storage and how that will help the river? Well, they'll, they'll uh, dig part of it into the existing s soils that are there. So part of it will be below ground and, and part of it will be ab above ground. And uh, it will take water in from the towns and canal. And C43 itself, uh, store it, and then release it when the, the uh, estuary needs fresh water. And so the ultimate goal there is to help uh, maintain the cleanliness of the river and the estuaries? Cleanliness and salinity, salinity levels. levels. Yeah. Okay. Rick Barber and Pete Ananachi, we want to thank you for joining us here today on Newsmakers as we talk about some of the water quality and water supply issues here in Southwest Florida. Mm -hmm.